Hey everyone, this is Saksham Endirata, founder of Lights Out Studio and partner at Lights Out Venture. Well, I've been onto something incredibly exciting for the past few months. I have met some of the most celebrated entrepreneurs in the country. This actually started with me identifying a gap in the Indian startup ecosystem. You see, even though startups dominated the past decade in our country, we still kept looking back at what Silicon Valley breeds in its culture. I thought, it was time to change this. So here I am with an all new limited edition series where I talk to founders of some of the fastest growing startups in the country. And we ditch the traditional podcasting format that you've known. So sit back, sip that drink as I bring to you In The House. I think I'm going to call myself a coffee nerd. Even if I wasn't, I'd be totally smitten by this brand. Sleepy All has managed to create some orgasmic moments for coffee lovers in India. It's a brand that everyone wants to get associated with. Possibly a brand that every single brand wants to collab with. What is the story behind the journey of entrepreneurs who started Sleepy Owl? Arman's a very dear friend and this conversation has every construct of building a foundational direct-to-consumer brand in India. He dabbles into the challenges that come alongside killing with venture capital. He dabbles into his personal inspirations and motivations to become an entrepreneur and essentially stay one in spite of so many challenges that they faced while building this empire of a DTC brand. Here's an entrepreneur who wears his heart on his sleeve. So join me in the house with Arman Sood, co-founder of Sleepy Owl Coffee. You know you want to watch this one. You've been doing this for a while, right? And the brand is fairly well known. Uh, you guys are are popular. Uh, I'm sure there are people you. reaching out to you <laughs> saying Sleepy All ke founders se baat karni hai. But uh, and Amit, I'm very accessible. Just by the very way, accessible. very accessible, <laughs> very very accessible. You'd know that I'm sitting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, you're very accessible. I 100% agree. What has this journey been like? And if you could tell me, what does entrepreneurship largely mean to you? Yeah, so the journey has been very humbling. Um, you know, it, it's not as rosy as it seems on the outside. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's nice to hear you say that, you know, I'm popular or like the business is well known, but, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a very, very tough journey. Uh, we've typically been, you know, outsiders to an industry and had to figure it out, right? Yeah. Uh, I have no FMCG experience or FNB experience per se. Yeah. Um, I was a lawyer, uh, or at least studied law graduated law school and then, uh, you know, jumped into entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship therefore means like you are okay with ambiguity, uncertainty, okay with not knowing where your next customer may come from or where, what your next product is or what your next strategy with distribution is. It's, you have to be okay living that life, okay taking risks, okay to be ready to figure it out and uh, you know have the tenacity and resilience to know that everything will be okay you know you have to just put your head down and do the work um, so yeah it has been much much tougher than we thought it would be when we got into it uh, I, I started my first venture when I was 19 uh, Sleepy Owl started when I had just graduated law school at 24 so I haven't actually worked at you know a full-fledged organization or uh, spend years in, in, in the corporate world. So now like when you're out there hiring people, building teams, uh, meeting clients, it's all about figuring it out and learning from your mistakes. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much what, you know, entrepreneurship has been like. Uh, no, I agree. Actually, you know, one thing you touched upon is pretty interesting, which is that you've been outsiders to this industry. And I think uh, entrepreneurship or modern business thinking now is no longer it doesn't depend on the number of years or how long you've been in business. It's about how how well do you understand and how much value can you provide, and you can just keep growing quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the you know good things about being an outsider though is that you look at uh, the problem at hand very differently, and the solution uh, to that problem is also thought about very differently. I feel if we were insiders, we'd be clouded with uh, yeah. the way insiders think, right? Yeah. So it's good to be an outsider, but it's also as tough and challenging because you don't have uh, you know anyone 
no godfather in the industry yeah. to guide you you have to figure it out but i think your your experiences uh, yesterday becomes a bit of a benchmark right like today's got to be better and the and this month's got to be better than the previous month and and today in say a few years down right mm-hmm. and i know you couldn't have said this 3 years back but maybe today when you look back in hindsight things worked out more or less and if it didn't it probably was for good right so so i think these experiences uh, the experience of being an entrepreneur matures you so much faster in life yeah 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 absolutely so, i think uh, you know we're 1% better every day 1% right? better every and, day and yeah. uh, you can look back and we look back even now and say okay you know what were we, what were we even thinking 2 years ago yeah. right and uh, uh, you know that as you go forward you may not make the same mistakes yeah. again and uh, yeah. you know you'll you'll come up with better solutions to the challenges at hand i'm so curious to know um, i know it it might be like a hectic day and week what do what do weekends typically look like for you are there some passions beyond work yeah so i i you know uh, So I love playing football. Uh I play football actually twice or thrice a week. Uh usually it's actually week nights, you know, you get done with work and everyone's done with work and you play from like 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Uh I try I try going to, you know, the gym or to a CrossFit and getting a workout again during the week. Uh Saturdays fortunately or unfortunately have been working for sleepy owl. So it's a bit more relaxed because we at least get together, we strategize, we chat, uh we get, you know, whatever work done. Sundays are the only days off and I have uh a lot of pets I have a bunch of cats and a couple of dogs Not bad. and I I really enjoy spending my Sundays with my wife and with them and like we spend the whole day uh you know mostly lazing around and the evening going to a park nearby and like running around with them um uh, I also like my Sunday afternoon beer and my Sunday afternoon nap <laughs> so you know yeah. uh, I feel like uh You know, yeah, I'm with you actually. Don't have that. the luxury to take naps anymore yeah. per se, but yeah. uh, Sunday afternoon is when I and then my wife hates it because she's uh, you know, she's like this is the one day we can like spend day time together. Yeah. And you prefer sleeping and I'm like I can't keep my eyes open on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. No, so, I agree. I for me Sunday brunches are special. I think I usually plan my weekends around Sunday brunches, the beer in the afternoon. And yeah, man. The f- yeah, it just I mean, tastes different, man. Yeah, <laughs> like like you come back home, or even if you're at home, the that three thirty four p.m. when you when you start feeling drowsy, and then you know you sleep it out. I think it's uh, it's amazing. Yeah, Sunday is also a good day for sports. So like I uh, you know I I usually prefer playing sport. Uh, but Sunday, you know, uh, you usually have the F one. You have maybe you know the Grand Slams and the finals of the Grand Slams. Uh, um there's a little smirk on the f1 how, how do this after this podcast we're going to dive a little deeper into f1 <laughs> okay okay fine um, although otherwise it'll just take away take away the the focus <laughs> of what we're getting into uh, but no sundays are good for you know yeah. that as well right 100%. and like i think you know uh you know i i love sport i love like you know the the idea of the competitive spirit and yeah. like the energy the enthusiasm the grit the determination for me a lot about like the hustle in sport can i connect it to the hustle in entrepreneurship right 100% yeah there's um, so much learning from sport that you can so derive there's so much learning yeah absolutely yeah. even even team sport for that matter because you're a unit you're a team you have to work together to win uh, even failure and loss in sport right i'm, I'm you know i don't know how sp- sports come in so deep into this conversation but i look at it very very uh, you know sincerely and therefore i i draw a lot of energy from sport as well yeah, yeah. interesting uh adil and i huge 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 f1 fans right so for us three things that are core passion areas one is travel this f1 and there's japanese food right japanese food and culture right so uh and f1 is such so ingrained in our lives we plan our weekends around it and uh if you've seen a race there is that moment of right after the formation lap they say and it's lights out and away we go and that is where the lights out name was derived from ah so it's we we take a bunch <laughs> of our uh, sort of very cool processes and and you mentioned there's motivation and sport uh-huh. so we take a bunch of our processes on how we debrief every weekend or week right um just like trooping up together to see whether it's it's running well mm. it's all from f1 uh, good, i mean, it could come like from cool. any sport yeah, yeah, i mean for sure but it's uh, i like the like the way you you know mentioned it in terms yeah. of the debriefing and the even the name right like it yeah. it's connected to the sport now that's fantastic now if you see it'll yeah. just connect the dots because everything is, the team is called pit crew and you know so just like some things that we've just put in if you look at our website is very sporty it's not a typical design studio website it's very sporty t- our logo is inspired by the track 
and so on so uh, just nice. there's a little bit of a narrative behind it and uh, yeah like i think f1 also gets me to connect with very interesting people uh, and 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 now i know that you are into it because f1 is typically a uh you know an interesting pedigree sport from whoever watches it right so you end up connecting with amazing people so wherever i go when i was in bombay i did that in bangalore i'm doing that i'm just creating f1 clubs around nice right so just like people want to watch the race together yeah. come together either call them home or go outside together and just watch the race together so interesting <laughs> uh cool so uh i'm going to dive deeper into you know the thick of things because this is something that i've been keen to understand right and you guys uh, hit it off as a product really well right and while there is so much or while there's information available on mm-hmm. on the milestones that sleepy all has achieved as a as a business i want to try and understand uh, when you look at it from the inside as a founder what when do you know or how do you know that you've achieved a product market fit in a sector like this okay um so we you know one of the one of the best representations of product market fit is you know your your repeat percentage numbers right um i think once you realize that there are people coming back again and again and again for the same product and the same person uh coming back over an m6 or a m12 or an m24 right uh you know that there is uh this stickiness that your product has with their behavior and is a part of their lives um and those numbers uh you know have been consistently good for us from the beginning right uh one of the challenges that we face is because it's coffee it's niche uh because it's uh, uh a certain kind of coffee and a certain uh, you know sort of an evolved product that we started with which required category creation required consumer education uh, acquisition for us has been deeply deeply challenging but we realize that those who we acquire we are able to convert and they stick to the brand so um you know we we look at that and and we know that yes we have uh you know achieved a product market fit for that category of product but something i've said earlier and i i stand by is that i think uh, you know a, a true product market fit at scale will take a long long time to happen uh, in food and beverage of, of just the way the category is wired the way the category is wired the way consumers are wired the way uh, consumer behavior is evolving it's not you know it's not evolving as quickly uh uh you know around the whole country right there are pockets and there are places and there's urbanization that you know has led to a certain uh you know kind of person who is ready to be an early adopter right but for that to trickle down to uh, you know scale uh, i think it's going to take more time in uh, evolved food and beverage categories right especially if yeah. you are going for clean label if you are going for a better for you product if you're going for sustainable packaging all of this premiumizes your product right the moment it's premiumized it is out of uh, reach for a certain audience right um and therefore acquiring consumers that's becomes that you, that's, that's a choice, a choice you yes. make as a business yes, right yes yes absolutely and uh, and you think the choice is uh, is it driven by uh, i mean for you guys was it driven by what the gap in the market looks like it was driven by what the gap in the market looks like plus it was driven by the fact that if your brand stands for these things uh and you stick to it and you're consistent with it chances are you will have a a following i'll be small but loyal and that will help you achieve what i call brand market fit right yeah. so i think once people associate with your brand uh, in a way that uh, you know gives them confidence and they know that okay this brand stands for xyz and therefore i buy it or therefore it's been recommended to me i think your products will gradually get adopted and become a part of their lifestyle as well yeah but it's brand market fit before individual product market fit got it and you guys i mean uh again sort of curious to know because there is so much that i essentially quote sleepy all for right uh so what's the mindset on uh, on just the overall marketing flywheel right and i'm not talking what's your distribution strategy or i'm not getting into what channels you look at or you know but what is the outlook on on marketing given that there is a certain level of consistency that you guys have you know uh, mm-hmm. adhered to since the time you started 
so how does uh, how do you arrive at that mindset or, or what do you think of that okay so i think uh, you know uh, when we started and uh, you know uh, my my co-founder decided that we would like to try and build our marketing and design in house as much as possible because you can own the uh, the vision the experience you don't need to brief anyone you don't need to make sure somebody else is doing it the way you want it done so no yeah. back and forth he led it from the front right and uh, uh, you know, it was always meant to be this, you know, clean, modern, uh, you know, uh, eye-pleasing design. Because we said that, okay, if someone has to purchase our products, the first thing they need to do is visually look at it either on the website or on Instagram or on Facebook, um, you know, or any other possible place. The first thing they'll do is see with their eyes, right? And if your product can make their mouth water, right, you have, half the battle's won. Right? And to do that, it has to be, uh, you know, to, to make their mouth water, it has to be pleasing. Uh, it can't be brash, it can't be, uh, you know, it, it, has to, it has to look a certain way that's pleasant. And uh, all our design, all our videos, all our focus was on making things look this way. And then you do it consistently enough so that people, you know, uh, who like relate it then to relate, relate yeah, to it overall, right? Um, so he's been very strict about this and of course it has its drawbacks as well you know it leads to less experimentation with uh, you know uh, you know other forms of uh, trying things out to see what works what doesn't but I think more or less it has worked for us and we have been appreciated for good design uh, which has led to people buying the product and then that when you buy the product then that design uh, it, it comes or comes across in the packaging as well in the unboxing experience because we've realized that you can't have a you know, uh, great image and then, uh, or a great video and then someone... You cannot not back it up with great packaging. You have yeah. to back it up with great, great yeah. packaging, yeah. great experience and then last but not the least, like a phenomenal product, right? Uh, that's where it ends because when they finally, you know, drink or eat what you're giving them, uh, they have to be like, okay, this has been 10 on 10 across the spectrum, right? Correct. And then that leads to repeat behavior for that customer. But more importantly, it leads to, hey, you know, I had a great experience with these guys, you should try them. That's the marketing flywheel, right? Which is unpaid, it's organic, it's word of mouth, right? Uh, that's what is, is, is uh, you know, tough to achieve. And uh, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that happens well. Amazing. I think I also relate a little bit of this to, to lifestyle. I think that has also got to do something with how the product uh, positions itself out, right? Uh, coffee as a as a product is, it could be both. It could be instant coffee. I mean, not instant from a form of coffee, but just like it, it could be a fast, quick experience. It could be something that you travel with. It could be something that you that you have conversations over, right? And Absolutely. Right from the from the very age old CCD culture to uh, having travel packs of coffee sachets. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, part of the marketing also uh, dives into how aesthetically pleasing can can the entire experience of having and savoring that moment can be like right i think and that becomes a little aspirational for uh, for the audience yeah without you know it's aspirational without being elite right so while our products yeah. are are you know while our marketing and our communication is aspirational uh, and obviously tuned to a lot of lifestyle marketing yeah. uh, you don't want to and we this is where we made sure that you know our products are Essentially, within arm's reach, right? Within arm's reach, within yeah. arm's reach, and also, you know, everything we've done is with a key focus on convenience, ease of use, and great taste, right? Yeah. The convenience and ease of use is what has made coffee less intimidating, right? Uh, you know, when we when we started, uh, uh, it was it was more popular. Like, I mean, instant coffee was the most popular, and there were brands, and we have full due respect for them to getting great quality coffee beans to Indians and kind of getting them to brew it. But as youngsters and fast paced millennials, we realized that, you know, very few people will actually do this or, you know, the, yeah. for, for a lot of people to do this, it will take a lot of time. Yeah. So why not simplify this experience? So we didn't want to be elite in any way. But uh, yes, you know, uh, we're still aspirational for no, I, the larger audience. Yeah, it is aspirational, right? Like, I mean, I'm a I'm a 90s kid, right? If you're a 90s kid, you typically have grown with 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 Nescafe and you know having cold coffee at home. Absolutely. Right? And, and and when I look at a product like this, I'm like, that's the experience I would now want to evolve to when having cold coffee, right? So uh, I think I think that uh, that game is uh, 
of just like pleasing the aesthetics is is pretty much on point yeah as as entrepreneurs right like uh, i think we we were solving our own problem in a way right like right. we felt the problem we felt there are enough people around us with a similar problem yeah. and we wanted to solve for that right so uh, i think it's it's great when you know you're solving a problem that you face because you really understand the challenges and uh, it's that's what has you know really gotten us this far but i think the next phase of the journey is like you know now looking at the consumer understanding who our customer is and what problems they face beyond just what we feel or think how uh, and here's where i'm happy to just step in as well because i think this is more of a conversation i want to have with with someone who's running a dtc brand right and a successful one how do you zero down on on your core demographic because as a product you could you would want to appeal to a to a wider range and right mm-hmm. i mean it has its own share of uh, pros and cons but how do you zero down on this is what my demographic should look like i think uh, you know firstly when you, when you launch or when you start right uh, you don't you don't know who your customer is you right. you may have an idea at least i'm talking back in 2016 when we had one sku we didn't know who exactly our customer is right advantage of being d2c is that you do get data of broadly on age where your customer resides how they came to your platform uh, you get to then create local like audiences market and get more people one of the things we have founders have done is from day one picked up the phone and spoken to our customers right uh you know ask them questions understood their habits understood their preferences and that tells you a lot more about who your consumer is um i think where we are uh in the last in the last 5 years with this you know the immense growth of let's say uber ola netflix uh you know hotstar um and 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 you know people really really utilizing this we've realized that our core demographic is the one who's also an early adopter in the future of technology right uh in a big way because they are the ones who are viewing and are exposed to what's going on in the world around them yeah, uh, globally new new trends and they're willing to pick up new things absolutely and and, shot, and, yeah. and also then you know you narrow it down further it's essentially someone who is well traveled uh right who is willing to experiment and premiumize their general experience right so if someone's going from eating uh you know your regular conflicts uh, or a chocos to a granola right that's like a you know or a muesli for that matter like they have evolved in their understanding of the two products and their difference right and so, was this experientially driven for you guys or i mean possibly data gave you more insights on this but was was this a conscious effort right to right at the outset or is this something you all evolved to no i think it's something we evolved to right like i said in the beginning you don't know who your customer is the more people start like getting recruited into the brand using it talking about it telling you uh their overall you know lifestyle right you get to understand who it is um of course what we did with this is then we you know focused on targeting uh you know let's say designers creatives uh you know people people working in creative roles in creative environments uh uh not your typical uh you know bpo or corporate office necessarily uh the focus was always on like young hustling professionals right yeah. uh could be consultants could be you know people working in investment firms vcs pes could be young entrepreneurs could be uh agencies so we said okay these are this is where our customer lies more or less could be male could be female uh but this is where they are and how do we get to them and how do we target them the working millennial in say metro cities the working millennial in metro cities but yeah. with covid was like this this realization that damn like you know we have uh people in tier 2 and tier 3 and that is you know 40% up up to 40% of our business two reasons for that one is again because uh you know we have had a lot of people move from urban centers back to tier 2 tier 3 around the country to their families to their homes because for two years you haven't had like you know the need to come to or live in a metro if if you don't if you're not from there right uh so i think that was one of the reasons that that happened and second is i think uh, more and more people just came online and were searching for you know uh today go put the word coffee in and we won't we will not leave you for a few weeks months maybe uh on every possible yeah. channel you will be you know we will follow you along until you give us your money yeah yeah <laughs> so so i think people you know who even started searching for things to order home uh and got more attuned to e-commerce and d2c in tier 2 and tier 3 they have been recruited into our customer base as well 
Um, so that was shocking, surprising, but uh, it's given us the view that uh, we, you know, we, we have a larger market out there beyond what we initially imagined, which is very, very positive. I think it's essential, right? You have to keep uh, constantly trying to get new, newer audience sets into your business. Uh, I think that does two things. One is, is that exposes you to tastes and preferences, which you weren't very sure of. But, but now after a certain scale, you want to just, just try that out and see if this, this hits, uh, you know, this hits a yeah. chord with them. And secondly, that also gives you the ability to possibly try and see, if not this, what is a product that can come closest to my to my value system that I can still create, uh, right, and push it out uh, because it targets a, a newer segment of the market, um, right? And uh, I feel that's something that uh, after a certain point in in your growth cycle, you have to start experimenting with. Absolutely. Because there's a stable base that, that already exists, right? Uh, the idea is to now build on top of it. So, uh, what is, uh, I mean, how has, how have the dynamics in business changed uh, for y'all in the past two years versus what was before that and, and for the lack of a better uh, sort of bifurcation, maybe this is pre-COVID, post-COVID, right? Because you are largely a direct to DTC business, right? A mm -hmm. direct to consumer business and, and DTC has seen a lot of uh, changes, both mindset and technology. So how has that been for y'all? So, you know, we started off as a DTC business and uh, we felt that uh, for a young brand to stand out and get customer attention or at least uh, differentiate ourselves from who else is in the market, DTC would be the best way to go. Yeah. And that's what we did uh, for the first two and a half, three years. Our entire focus was completely on building our own website and getting customers, you know, to come purchase directly from us. Uh, and that is what true D2C is, right? Because you're not available at marketplaces or any other channel other than your own website. Uh, so I said that's when we were that's when we were a true D2C company. Yeah. Uh, you know, around COVID and when COVID started is when we when the realization dawned upon us that it is or could be more convenient for a lot of customers to go to one place for their entire basket, right? And that's when we doubled down on uh, Amazon, Big Basket. Now Flipkart, and in the last year, like e-commerce has blown up, right? And um, yeah. uh, for us, it, it, it's been a no-brainer to you know partner with them, right? Of course, that reduces the propensity of direct to consumer or someone coming to our website, but it is the channel where you know uh, customers can satisfy their impulse needs uh, and wants, and uh, so we are available on these channels as well. Um, of course, what we've done intelligently or trying to still do is understand what works where. Right, uh, there are certain products, especially our gifting and like our uh, merchandise, etc. That is meant to be on our direct-to-consumer channel, and that's what we own. That is not available anywhere else. So if consumers want that, they come to us, and we're able to service them. But uh, you know, let's say a ready-to-drink product, which is more impulse, or an instant coffee, which is more impulse, uh, is available across all other partners and channels. Uh, the next phase of our journey um, is that, uh, and we've realized this is you. You don't want to just depend on this, right? Uh, and while uh, it is true, the the e-commerce wave in India, the D2C wave, uh, you know, the adoption of, of internet and e-commerce is is totally blowing up. But uh, India is still, or Bharat still is uh, largely offline, right? And uh, that's a matter of fact. And for a brand in the F&B space, uh, it would be incorrect for us to stay away from that channel. So you know, as of the last 12 months and going forward, we are doubling down hard on our offline strategy as well. Interesting. Uh, each of these is a different ball game and yeah. each of these is like an absolutely new area for us to venture into and figure out. Uh, you know, it's exciting. Yeah, you're right. Exciting. Retail is a, like offline retail is... Uh, it's a different beast. It's a, it's a different game and uh, I think uh, having established a certain level of... Uh, understanding of the market, how consumers behave, what products would sell in which markets is what the D2C, uh, the, the online business would mm -hmm. give you and then you would be able to push. Uh, Absolutely. You yeah. use data from your online yeah. business to build your offline business. That's yeah. the that's what we have. You know, yeah. it's not I mean, you're not going to be selling uh, the travel packs in in city or two cities, right? No. Uh, so 
yeah i mean, I, I think uh, that is the organic uh, progression that typically a consumer business goes through do you still call it direct to consumer i mean not you but like do you still think it should be called direct to consumer cuz i've often had this no, debate with no, people no no i don't i think you know i was uh, talking to a few folks recently and like it's misused overused uh, you know loosely in, in, used, in, lo- loosely used yeah. let's say uh, as a term um i think if if there were you know i mean if a brand was had more than 90% of their business coming directly from you know their own channel which they own and they provide that would be truly d2c um but you I know i think d2c is more like hey i started as a d2c business and now we're just ramping up and moving all out but uh, yeah fair enough or or let's say then you know another way of looking at it is i is your mindset d2c you know is your mindset gathering consumer data talking to your consumers owning that piece giving them a direct experience building a brand you know like uh, you, know, you can't be a d2c business if you're not focusing on your own email marketing running your own ads building your own funnels uh you know acquiring customers giving them experiences talking to them regularly right if you're not doing that you're not d2c right uh, so so yeah i think for us we are still have a strong hold on d2c because we do own maintain control our own website as a big channel of sales uh but yes i think with the way and where the world is going yeah. like you got to be everywhere yeah i think technology is where uh, an unicorn of technology essentially helps you stay closer to data it helps you dissect uh you know your funnels your you can you can literally go as deep as a, you know talking about customer preferences in in a particular household absolutely right and uh, and i think that data is what you use so more than dtc uh, businesses now that are largely online also offline would would qualify as consumer tech itself because uh, you are selling to the consumer across multiple channels absolutely. but uh, but maybe you use a uh, an undercurrent of technology to get uh, to next steps right um interesting and what is uh, Uh, it's a competitive sec- sector right yeah it is what is the mindset you need to have because there is always so much happening there are entry barriers are relatively low uh, right all you need is is your sourcing partnership and and a website in a in a category like this right and and a great product which is uh, no, 100% thorough I mean, npd and r&d and uh, you know see at, at the end of the day uh, the bharat that you're talking about is so hmm. diverse that y- you'll get numbers anyway right and I, and i and i wouldn't take names but i know of a of a peanut butter brand based out of gujarat that does 8 crores in in monthly revenue mm. uh, so and that's no brand that's just selling this is selling on amazon so uh, you the barriers are relatively low and, yeah. and but, but what does it look like mentally what is it that you you've got a brace uh, in a highly competitive sector i think uh, you know you have you have to you have to kind of learn how to filter out the noise as well right because uh, in in our case i can tell you is you know we've uh, we were I- into the market very 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 early yeah. right uh, um you know yeah you guys like started the game yeah we started about 6 years ago and we started the game um, and in the last couple of years we've had a lot of brands come in and do things very similar to to yeah. what we've done and uh, you know i think it's uh, flattering to see it happen uh, yeah. but at the same time uh, we do realize that uh, there is a lot of scope in growth in coffee as a category overall right and uh, that for now it is more the merrier right i think more and more consumers will get recruited into consuming coffee uh, they will have good and bad experiences with any brand that they interact with right uh but the day and the moment that uh, they come and they try or or experience what we have to offer that's where everything that i said about you know from every touch point which is the moment they interact with the brand could be offline could be online could be on q commerce uh to the experience of receiving it unboxing it and if you can give them that delight uh you know uh they they will they will hopefully continue to be sticky with you and even if they are not sticky with you directly i think they should have a good experience to talk about right yeah uh, i'm not saying everyone who has our product will be like hooked on to it for life uh, right uh, people sometimes try things to see how it is uh, and then may go back to their default choice and that's fine so you experience a lot of trials uh, but as long as they've had a good experience and not a bad experience uh, 
uh, chances are that they will spread the good word about you to people and gradually we will find our loyalists right um, i think competition is a good thing in a way right 100%. like i mean it opens the market it keeps us on our toes it keeps you on your toes you're constantly innovating because otherwise yeah you would stagnate in some ways i also think uh, from the way algorithms are wired now having competition only in a way reduces your acquisition costs right because uh yes and no uh i mean yeah <laughs> i mean we have you're battling for the same share uh, yes. where where you have to bid higher 100% i agree i mean it's funny when you have to bid higher on your own keyword 100% you know, i agree like <laughs> uh that's maturity of the product line i would say i mean right uh, sure. but at the end of it uh, in a way someone else who's whose product is exposed to say a a target group that you are not uh i think if you can ride on some of those sets just purely algorithm plays uh you can just benefit out of someone having searched for coffee in a region absolutely. that you haven't absolutely right for sure. so uh so in those ways you you your discovery becomes relatively easier and i don't know the net impact it would have on acquisition costs but but it opens the market and what what prevails is uh is retention based behavior right like mm-hmm. if you can reorder the product again you could sample them once but if you are not ordering it again then that means they are not or you are not a fit for them and that match is just not going to fit so uh, i think competition uh, just takes you down to its to your very bare bones in terms of who is your customer and who could you target once again and who could you serve again as a as a product Yeah and it also gives like i guess more confidence to you know uh to our investors to us that like this is a category to fight the for right? like growing, if you're right, not yeah. you're not niche you're not you're not in a small category yeah. or in a category where there is intense competition there's a lot of people vying for share of pie yeah. and the more people that come in the pie also keeps getting bigger right because yeah. you're all uh you know uh, recruiting people into the category So I think it's exciting, um, and uh, you know we look forward to see yeah, how, how where this goes. Yeah, one thing it definitely has done is given rise to Chick Mangalore for coffee tourism, <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good, right? I mean, when we yeah. started, one of our reasons for having or selecting or partnering with Indian coffee farms yeah. or Indian coffee traders was that uh, India grows phenomenal coffee. Like yeah. you know, we were shocked to you know find out that like it's all exported out. India doesn't drink coffee. We went and ordered our, you know, as entrepreneurs, we went down. uh spend a lot of time in chikmangalore and said listen you know we want 5 kgs of coffee to take back and they were like you guys must be crazy like you know what are you going to do with 5 kgs we don't even want to sell to you and, what, and which is, coffee were you buying so we were buying uh, like a 100 percent arabica coffee a medium roast um and that's what we wanted to start with we had you know preferences of the kind of notes that we wanted that coffee to have um and we spoke to a lot of farmers and it was a bit you know you know we export tons and tons and like you know 5 kgs and like you guys must be crazy like you know as when I mean, you 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 kids don't know what you're doing and uh, you know now we're like you know upwards of double digit tons uh, on a monthly basis and we look back and we're like okay you know this is it's been a crazy journey right yeah. and you got to believe that it will work out you got to believe that uh, things will shape up and uh, yeah but if you don't try you wouldn't know so i think one of the key aspects of entrepreneurship is just you know jump in and then you learn how to swim is sleepy owl a marketing company or is it a distribution company very interesting <clears throat> and i and i'll tell you why i'm asking i like i like how you have ignored product company in no you so know. product without a product you wouldn't be sitting here fair enough right so product yeah. is a given but what is it that you've prioritized okay. over time we've uh till now we prioritized uh you know brand building marketing uh and now moving forward the priority is to back it up with strong distribution so we're evolving you know i think uh businesses and companies are different things at different times yeah right and uh our, our focus was actually not even marketing you know we're uh strong focus on design strong focus on brand strong focus on advertising i think now we're getting into marketing so have you had an instance where someone said i recognize sleepy out and i want it but i don't i'm not able to get it uh, i i think uh not as much i'm not able to get it i've heard of you guys but i haven't tried it and we're like why there's just no answer you know so it's like we've heard a lot about you guys or we've seen it around uh but we haven't tried it um so i think that's where we we realized like you know we need to strengthen our distribution 
uh, do a lot more trial and sampling so that at least people try it so that they know that okay it's a good product uh, and then that would you know ricochet on to repeat purchases or you know regular purchases for that matter no i'm a big believer in uh, in building a business especially a consumer business with a very strong leg of brand uh, i think because after the dust settles no what stays is the brand largely right uh, you may not be available on a single day but if if your brand loyalty is high and of course i will give mm. credit to the product in any case if your brand loyalty is high maybe the customer will wait for another day to order right uh, some of those become benchmarks for how you how loyal a customer is he will not switch yeah so uh, and and brand plays that role in a customer's 100%. life 100% 100%. We in fact did a you know did a survey where we inquired from our existing consumer base as to uh you know how how many people would be disappointed if Sleepy Owl shut down tomorrow you know Amazing. would it make a difference and we had 93% people say it would disappoint them so i think that's a healthy sign or a healthy number that is 93% of your total user base not the total user base those who responded to the those survey i forget the, the exact number the right. sample size yeah. um but uh, well, it was a fairly long survey as well covering a lot of things that we were trying to get from our customers but this this question you know had a 93% of them would be disheartened or disappointed if we shut down i think that's a strong enough number for us to realize that what we're doing has a lot of value uh it is important to people you know matlab it is not a uh, fly by night operation we were here today and not there tomorrow you know Correct. or we can do what we want to and we're not held accountable for it right. i think we built a brand that uh does does inspire people you know um whether it's the you know our route to entrepreneurship and what we've created and therefore inspiring that people have done this outside of the industry or the age at we with we started or the the you know how we came with a bang with like brand new innovative category defining products um i think each of those things has led to our consumer as well as the viewer uh you know be inspired and therefore we have to hold ourselves responsible to maintaining the legacy and being accountable to them right yeah and uh, while you would sort of don um, you know tons of hats on a day to day basis as a founder mm-hmm. what is uh, what is your leadership style like and has that evolved over time so um you know my leadership style is very people first uh i i and this is not for the camera <laughs> no it's not for the camera at all like i think uh, everyone into my co-founder say arman you're too nice you know and i i i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing yeah. um you know i like to i like to have you know my work done and like i'm strict in that way but i'm just a nice person right like i feel like uh with people around me uh you know i i can't lose my cool or lose my shit uh um and i think my leadership style is more people first people friendly uh trusting as well right i don't has that uh, has that ever fired 100% it's backfired yes but that shouldn't change you know i think you know if one in 10 times it backfires that uh should make me cautious but shouldn't change my style 100% right because that any other style is not natural to me it would be something i'd have to pick up and develop um the other side is that i think i I like to get my hands dirty as an entrepreneur. I spent too long when we started doing everything and therefore getting my hands dirty. So even today like you know if there's you know if say there's a truck outside the warehouse and stuff is going in and I happen to be there and I say okay let me pick up a box and take it in. Everyone's like you know sir mat karo. And I'm like dude why like you know i'm just yeah, picking up a box and moving it like i'm i'm you know i'm healthy i have my hands and legs and like and you enjoy that because it's your baby right it I is mean, absolutely no work is 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 menial absolutely you know, yeah, no, you know and i agree um, i mean we had something broke you know i found the the broom and i sweeped it to look to a corner or put it in a bin you know it raises eyebrows in our you know i guess in india or or you know with how yeah. society is that it raises eyebrows that you know you can't do this you can't you're the no, boss I and i'm like you. you know i think that's not me again right so so that's that's my i think know, that keeps you more connected keeps you more grounded 100% and it you know it also creates an aura of like we're all equals at the end of the day right? like my designation or uh, where i am or who i am should make no difference to you know 
our our environment or our yeah. or our place so what is the weightage that you typically give to or you guys the three of you all would give to strategy versus execution i think uh, because i know you're strategizing quite a bit yeah but i think uh, you know we've been we've been like very very hard on on execution last couple of uh, months or years you know and especially when you go through cycles of fundraising and covid and hiring uh, you know uh, yeah, you, it's not as foreseeable yeah so we end up doing a lot of day to day execution uh, but i think now that we have uh, you know a strong team around us and let's put it this way for the first uh, you know four and a half five years it was the three of us driving the business so we were doing everything and strategizing uh you know i'm thinking about the larger picture or the or the next year's goals or the vision i think now we're at a stage where we should spend time strategizing uh you know and have a few people around us who are good at what they do to execute as well right i think execution requires domain specific knowledge to some extent uh rather than figure out and execute so so i think uh you know the focus now will be on strategy over execution execution will happen but we'll have people and in our team and strategy i mean more from it. the standpoint that you want to try and see what new can happen what else can you do from here on both uh, both what new can happen what else can we do as well as strategizing about you know what are the ways and means to continue to scale this uh, in innovative and interesting ways right like what is the brand stand for how do we define our customer who are we targeting how do we refine it what kind of partnerships and alliances that we can leverage uh, you know what kind of new avenues can we can we think about and develop i think spend a lot more time a lot lot more time talking to other founders operators as well and understand you know how they've built their businesses what have they done what's worked what's not and then go back with this information to our team and execute with them um, but i think it's that research and learning that we need to go out and do a lot more i think uh, last last year and a half two years we've been so locked in executing ourselves that you know when you wake up and see the world around you is like evolving very quickly as well yeah. so someone needs to do that um yeah and you know um i know while it, the business is born out of pure like understanding a market gap and the passion to to build it out uh do you ever imagine a scenario where what if you wouldn't have raised investments for it and what if you would have bootstrapped this mm-hmm. would it have been uh, a more passionate project or would it have been very uh, you know it would have been very niche in a way i think it would you like this road i you know i think it uh, had we not gone down this road uh, okay one of the biggest advantages of uh, raising capital uh, you know is of course you can uh, take 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 a little bit more risk you can experiment you can uh, you know uh try things you may not have been able to try it without the capital we also have mentors in in our investors right who yeah. have a wealth of experience and they are around and they want us to succeed right so they are guiding us they're talking to us they're uh, mentoring us in our journey right they've also invested in other similar businesses so we now have a very very easy access and to to fantastic founders around us um uh, who again you know are people we talk to learn from um and not just them but their entire teams are accessible to us as well as well right so there's a cross sharing and exchange of information that that is happening uh, i'm not saying if we were outsiders it wouldn't have happened but this is easier right because raising capital i think is a very conscious decision that that you make as a business right and Absolutely. and there's no turning back from there because no there isn't because there's a massive amount of trust that's riding on yeah. you from the outside so i'm just like trying to understand the perspective of uh, does that thought ever cross your mind or is this what you now want to grow within you no know, we want to grow with this now and i i think we also realize that if you want to build a large consumer business it requires uh you know marketing dollars and uh you know dollars to fight the the largest players in the market right i think had we not raised funding at the time we did um uh, you know we'd get overrun by those who had and uh, it would have right. been unwise to you know try and just bootstrap this through and through yeah um it also depends on your goals and vision and and you know where you want to go and we want to make sleepy owl a large fmcg business um and for that uh, it does require you know the muscle that comes with investment and yeah yeah since you said there's no turning back yeah, you also no don't live with regrets then, right? right you have to just look forward yeah. so what's your uh, have you ever i mean you guys recently opened up a new new market right 
which is instant coffee. Yeah. And before that, it was fairly niche. Correct. Um, what's What's your personal take on uh, how a business like this should be governed? Should it Should it stay focused in niche, or should it open up to try and experiment? So you know what we realized is that uh, you know if our battle is with getting people to start drinking coffee and 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 move over from other beverages, right? Let's say you have tea drinkers who form a large population and yeah. you have soda drinkers or so on and so forth and you want them to start enjoying coffee, right? Out of curiosity, are you a tea drinker as well? Uh, yes, I'm a beverage person, man. I drink everything. You drink everything. I drink everything, uh, more or less. Awesome. So, yeah. Cool, yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, go on. No, no. <laughs> so we have like, you know, if the, if the battle is to convert people drinking other beverages to coffee, yeah. right? Um, I think what what we were offering was the easiest form of a freshly brewed coffee, which was a, a dip bag, which a customer can add hot water and brew, and then the cold brew, which requires, you know, an overnight brewing time. Therefore, some patience. Um, so, so there was a, a, a slightly steep learning curve for customers to do this, which means it's a behavior change, it's a habit change, right? And that takes a lot of time. So if we really want to succeed in that mission, then we, we should be at the entry level as well, which is instant coffee, which people understand, right? What was happening is a customer moving from tea to coffee would start with instant coffee that we didn't have, right? And then maybe move up to our products. So why not do it with us as a brand as well, right? So we should be there. Same way, as the customer moves up, we never offered beans or ground coffee, right? So customers who drank our hot brew or cold brew uh, for months, years, would then say, okay, I want to brew my own. And then they'd move to brands that were offering beans and ground coffee, which we didn't. So we were losing customers at the upper end and we were losing customers at the entry level as well, right? So all we had was this segment in the middle, which was offering like this really delicious convenient product, but uh, we, we didn't focus on the instant or have it. And we didn't have the freshly roasted beans and ground coffee. Uh, we did both because we said that we want the customer to live and breathe sleepy owl and we should offer the entire spectrum of products because it isn't so large uh, category this is that the, we could the category dominant strategy absolutely that take over the whole category offer everything in the category because people are not necessarily saying that you know okay it's this product or that product we consciously offer great quality in all the categories but i think they come to us because of the of the brand and how it makes them feel and the service that they get and the style with which we do things in terms of the overall experience that uh, you know people come to the brand and say okay this is cool uh, and there's enough trust I believe that we built over the years that if we put our name to something people would be like okay probably probably good because Sleepy Owl is yeah. is doing it you know yeah. so that's what we're trying to build we pretty much do you know. Uh, if you don't like it, 100% replacement. You don't like the merchandise, 100%. If you broke your French press, we'll give you a new one. No questions asked. You know, it's not. Uh, You'd give a new one if, if someone yeah. broke their French press. Wow. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mostly, yeah. I mean, unless you, I mean, you know, if you like, fling it. I off. mean, <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it. You, you, you know, you can see as as a founder, as as a person t talking to our consumers, you can see uh, when it's a genuine. You know, so we give tumblers with straws, right? So we have people, oh shit, I lost my straw. I'm like, don't worry, man, we'll give you a straw. Like, you know, in fact, we went to our suppliers and said, listen, just give us a couple of hundred extra straws in the next order because people are misplacing their straws. You yeah. know, so and then it just looks bad if it's with a plastic you straw. You can't, yeah, you, you can't. The tumbler works with the straw. So it yeah. has to have the straw that we give it, yeah. give with it. And uh, so you, you, we, we react to those things, right? Like we saw that problem and we, there was an immediate fix to it. So we went back and said, okay, like, keep a few buffer straws, you know, how does it matter? Just keep it ready in case something happens to someone, yeah. we can equip them and they can continue using our product. Yeah. Is, uh, uh, do you like draw inspiration from, from some people in life? Um, yes, uh, you know, most definitely. I mean, I mean it, could um, be, it could be people or businesses or whatever. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, yeah, people, businesses, both. Yeah, you look around you and you see like, uh, you know, um, Let's talk about a couple of those. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, to start with, uh, as cliche as it may sound, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, I've had a, uh, my parents inspire me, man, no doubt. My mom's like this. No, it's not uh, cliche at all, I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, no, I think everyone, most people would, you know, to some extent feel like their parents inspire them, but I have like specific instances. So my dad's a businessman and, uh, you know, he's had like a lot of hits and misses in business all his life. And uh, I've seen him persevere and like, you know, stay at it and go for it. He's, 
he just turned 60 and he still has like the most wild ideas of businesses that he wants to try his hand at, right? Um, and I feel like, you know, despite not striking gold, he has so much uh, enthusiasm to, to think about and want to try things, right? And my mom's a teacher and she still works like, you know, six, seven days a week uh, as a private tutor. And I've seen her like do this consistently for years on end. So like the persistence with which she does it and the passion with which she does her work. And, uh, you know, uh, I feel like if I can have even 1% of that, like it would be, it would, you know, I would sail through. Uh, so obviously, you know, my, my mom was like, you know, she's come from a certain amount of privilege because they were able to, you know, uh, when I asked them for seed funding, they were able to give that to me to start Sleepy Owl. So forever grateful that, you know, we were, we were able to ask them and then receive their support. But more than that financial support, the fact that like, they allowed me to make these switches in my career and uh, do this. So I feel like they're very trusting, right? Like, and that's inspiring because, uh, you know, I think a lot of times for, for young people, it's a battle with your family. It's a battle with the world you're doing. Like, you know, you want to create a startup, you want to do something on your own and therefore you're battling the world to bring that to life. But if you have like the second battle going on at home, uh, yeah, just, your, your mindset just, yeah, you can't do it, up. right? Like here, here yeah. I was building Sleepy Owl knowing that, yeah. you know, I could fuck it all up and like I can just go back to them and yeah. they will feed me. Yeah, you know? there's, a, there's a safety net. There's yeah. a safety net. Though, like, it's, I also feel like you shouldn't always build a business knowing there's that safety net because that mm -hmm. keeps you, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, devoid of risk. Um, but yes, yeah, somewhere deep down, knowing that I have people who wish, you know, wish the best for me and want me to succeed made life a lot easier. So definitely very inspiring there. Um, I think uh, on the business side, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think after we started Sleepy Owl 2016 till now, we've seen so many other, uh, you know, people build businesses in other categories around us. And we're like, okay, wow, like, you know, that's really cool. What they're doing is really cool. How are they doing it? So whether it's XYXX, Whole Truth, Happy Jars, so many other businesses around us. My wife runs a kombucha business, even more niche, but you know, they're at it, creating you know, a fantastic product. So looking at all these founders crop up around us and uh, you know, people doing better than us, people hustling it out, you just get to see like uh, everyone hustling and trying. And I think that's very inspiring that the ecosystem, ecosystem is current, you know, constantly burgeoning. Like it's not, you know, it's not that, uh, 16, 17 was when the boom happened. I think like even today, there is scope for people to start, right? Uh, and that's Yeah, there are new ideas. There, is, there are new ways in which you're promoting products. You're doing collaborations. You're testing uh, new markets. Uh, All of these things, yeah. yeah. So, so it's very inspiring about. to see, you know, look around you and you'll keep seeing this. Um, and I think, you know, of course, you adopt constant inspiration from what's going on. Um, and then in exchange, like when you have people starting out, uh, you know, I think in the beginning you said, right, like uh, accessible or whether I'm accessible. So like, I'm always happy for my email ID and phone number to be shared because, you know, I think I, I try and take out slots of time to talk to anyone to share my experiences, right? I don't think, uh, you know, I have like gyan or knowledge or I've made it that I can give you the secret sauce or tricks to success. But I think one reason why I'm here is because I think we can all learn from each other's experiences and having six years in this industry, in this business, if anything that, uh, you know, I, I, I can share with you about my experience that may benefit you or help you or stop you from reinventing the wheel, why not, you know? And that even means to a large extent sharing contacts or like, you know, resources. So it's like, I'm not gonna take, uh, you know, the phone number of the procurement head of a particular company to my grave, right? So if if you know if, except for my key key competition if yeah. anybody needs it like i'm happy to share it yeah. right no true um, no i think the mentality is is pretty similar across the board right yeah. like today modern businesses are not looking at competition as much as competition but just like a way for the sector to thrive for uh, for, for more ideas or avenues to come to life and more like a collaborative approach and i think that's changing i i, I wouldn't say that it's it's there i just mm. think we've got to st we still have a long way to go in in this mindset more progressively. But, uh, but I think uh, collaboration is something that most modern consumer or tech businesses are adopting. And they're open to, uh, whether it is having conversations with the outside world, like uh, if you typically remember the first half of the last decade, the, the 2000 to the 2015 generation of businesses that came up, all that they had to 
look back upon is uh, go to the west and see what an apple facebook early days of airbnb early days of spotify but right like what's happening out mm. there uh, and that was and those were some of the only stories documented or what's how is amazon building and so on right and what's what happened with paypal for that matter yeah so there was nothing in india to to read about or to learn from those experiences because even though india was such a diverse market nobody was talking about it mm-hmm. the second half of the decade saw a lot of lot more emergence in terms of those experiences being spoken about uh, or being documented and i think it is essential that uh, you give the taste of what your uh, where you've succeeded and where you haven't both sides uh, to everyone out there just so that you're right and nobody has to reinvent the wheel uh, it just strengthens uh, the the entire ecosystem in a way uh, the markets mature so yeah i i agree with that uh, any particular uh, business or model uh, outside of india that sort of uh, you guys look up to uh, because i know you guys have a very interesting take on design right uh, while that while there's fine eye for detail and and mm-hmm. that's a given uh, a lot of times you end up getting inspired by say a few businesses outside uh, is that the case yes i think uh, you know it's it's <clears throat> in in our I'll, I'll try and like you know answer not in our category right sure. like so i mean if you look at you know uh, from a from a design and presentation side like you know casper away i think they've done a phenomenal job in marketing and marketing communication and design just yeah. the whole piece right like it's yeah. it's amazing to see them uh you know talk about their products and build it the way they have yeah um so that's definitely you know phenomenal and i think in the in the coffee category it's been amazing to see companies like chameleon and blue bottle um or even for that matter high brew coffee to to grow the way and, and there's the you know the super coffee as well uh which was on you know shark tank usa yeah. and uh they're building huge businesses right with with uh very very innovative products and they've been of acquisition interest to companies like nestle and uh, so on and so forth so i think uh you know just to see them being able to to do that is very very inspiring and gives you confidence that like you know um as long as you you know innovate and and uh, stay ahead of the curve um and and you know put in the hours and build it out truthfully and honestly like there's a market for there's this. a market for this for sure do you i, I mean and i know because uh, there is something new that constantly keeps popping up right it could be a new trend it could be a new product it could be a new flavor it could be a new channel yeah uh, is there a sense of fomo that grips you as an entrepreneur or as a founder that you know this is I, what i want to do yeah 100% uh, so i think uh, you know you know when you see what's going on around the globe right and now like we're so interconnected like i you know i do know the latest trends uh in coffee in tea in food and beverage right and you're like okay you know this is phenomenal and like you tr- you know we keep calling for products from around the world or when we travel we get to have those products and we're like you know we need to do this in india right um but the the challenge is always that like you know either indian manufacturing indian supply chain or indian consumers yeah are we just not ready for it right so sometimes i wish we could you know flip the switch and flip just, the switch yeah, and be 10 years ahead uh, in, yeah, yeah yeah for sure um yeah, and then assuming you could assuming you pull off the supply chain you pull off the manufacturing uh you know and it takes a lot of hustle to you know create it here because we're not there infrastructurally yet uh how, you know then the indian consumer bit comes in and you will find your consumer uh it but it will be just so small that uh you know uh then you and then you're betting on the next 10 years 15 years of as it grows we grow right uh, and then it becomes unviable to execute those businesses uh and therefore you're forced to look at what is large scale uh but the sad bit is that a lot of large scale things are done dusted and then you're playing a distribution game or a price war or you know premiumization to some extent uh so then that's where you know there is and there's, debate and there's limited return in that like True. after a point of time the the value of even premiumization or playing a discount game is fairly limited True. right like i mean you can get the ball rolling into something new but uh, the sustainability of uh, or the sustenance of a brand cannot be driven on some of those you know quick measures i absolutely agree with you 
Yeah. It's short term thinking it's if you think. It's short term thinking, right? I mean, it's great. Yeah. I mean, you you could you could test a bunch of things out. You could test a few models out. Uh, you could see if there's a market at a higher price or a lower price maybe or if mm-hmm. discounts work or if your customer is interested in something like this um, or uh, yeah but uh, yeah but I think uh, with uh, with with so much that's happening right uh, do you ever uh, do you ever walk up to the founder of another competitor brand and, and just have a casual chat on yeah what's yeah. up yeah I mean for sure when we meet uh, socially yeah. right uh, uh, there's always like you know I think uh, you know a smile, a good conversation, so on and so forth. And when we started Sleepy Owl in 2016, you know, prior to starting, we met. Let's say we met Matt at a Blue Tokai Cafe, and we told him we were starting, uh, and this is what we were doing. And he was encouraging, and he said, "Let me know when you launch." And this was probably in, in April. Did you still say that for a new uh, product line? In June, uh, when we launched our first product, we messaged him and. Uh, he ordered from our website as order number three or four back in the day, like on the day we launched, because we messaged him saying we've just launched and he ordered it. Um, so yeah, I mean that was you know it was we were happy to see that support, right? Like that openness, that support, that uh, yeah, I don't it's know. Encouraging, I, in a way. yeah, it was encouraging for sure, right? And uh, and we've been in touch on and off on the same panels or uh, you know I met, met him at a party, and I think it's um, you know definitely look up to what they've done. Uh, and uh, you know they they were ahead of that time, and I think uh, you know full re- full respect for uh, you know how they've gone about building that brand. Amazing. While well, sort of tapering down to you know the last few bits, what is uh, what's the one challenge that you face uh, when you wake up, or you know as an entrepreneur on a, in a, on a day to day basis? Not from a not from what's happening in the execution of a business. Mm-hmm. Like one day the operations might have taken a little bit of a toll and someday the ad wouldn't have worked but that's fine as an entrepreneur what is the biggest challenge you face i think it's uh you know you you we we want to you know we want we want to build an honest business right you want to build a business that uh is is creating the best products and giving the best service so what you know the the challenge that i think we face daily is that how do you ensure you're not disappointing your consumers, right? And I, I you know, uh, obsessively every single day track our support emails and then, you know, kind of try and highlight to the relevant stakeholders in the organization that this cannot happen again and we need to solve for this. So, like, uh, I do spend a lot of my time, you know, uh, and so it might not be challenging for me, but it becomes challenging for the organization to live up to that standard, right? Uh, and it's a gold standard. Like, you know, we are uncompromising because I know this right like you'll have people who can outprice you who will have people who can outdistribute you but you should never have someone who can outserve you right and the challenge is how do you maintain that standard yeah. so that's what keeps me awake um, as far as if there was uh, if there's one thing that you've evolved uh, in yourself mm-hmm. over a period of time of running this business what's that like I'm, I'm trying to be you know uh, less emotionally attached to things in the business right i think uh, when you start and i think off, that's a perennial challenge with most entrepreneurs yeah right? 100% like yeah. you know i as uh, and i still am and i still have that we still have like arguments and fights about how i need to Detach let go of an old way of working or like an old product or like a old strategy or an old way of thinking about things uh, but i think that's like one place where i have to continue to evolve is that you know yes it's my baby but uh, you know uh, you have to start like letting it grow up and think about things differently from how you did before. Um, I was telling one of my colleagues yesterday itself that like, you know, uh, when we launched, we had like a small event cart of six years ago. And when we had to, you know, get this like new cart or whatever built, I, I didn't want to throw that away. I just wanted to keep it, you know, and... Uh, yeah, you should have kept it. Yeah, but like, you can't lug it around from office to office if no one's going to use it, right? So I said, I'll make a bar out of it. Uh, today, I don't even know where it is. But in that moment, like, I was like, we cannot destroy this, you know, and I fought. I said, we have to keep preserve this. But, uh, yeah, so I, I'm emotionally attached to the business and I think that could cloud judgment and thinking as well. So I think that's why my co-founders are like, man, you know, let's let's detach for a moment and think about and it. You're, uh, and you, I think accepting uh, some of your... Uh, 
shortcomings or shortcomings yeah if yeah. you can't look at uh, you can't look at ev everything from different vantage points at all points yeah. right that's and why we also three of us right like each yeah. person is there to check you know i think spend most of this podcast and i haven't said much about my co-founders but they're like you know you want to take a minute on that yeah, yeah i'll take a minute on that uh, <laughs> you know i think uh, uh, definitely you know my advice to entrepreneurs is like have co-founders <coughs> that's you know, a big one have co-founders like 100% like i i wouldn't have done it any other way because entrepreneurship is like a a tough dark journey that you you know venture journey. into it's a lonely journey and yeah. if you're three then it's not so lonely because we have a yeah. lot of fun together and we have a blast while we are building this um and yeah so it's been like and and obviously you know I have them for the right, have them for the right reasons i yeah. think very crucial yeah. uh they are my best friends um but we bring something very un- each of us bring something very unique to the table yeah. uh, and we keep telling each other that listen i can't do what you do and you can't do what i do so trust so each other mix. to 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 do their best right yeah. no and i think 3 uh, 3 is like the perfect number right like i mean uh, you get the best of everything it's not too much with 4 it's not too less with 2 uh, 3 just like fits in uh, really well <coughs> yeah so yeah no i'm glad uh, that you're saying this because uh, i agree uh, having having co-founders is critically important you need someone to uh, battle you out of the bad judgment sure you need you need moral compasses beyond your own vision true uh, and you you need someone to strategize with who can just like sounding boards think core yeah. think long term think tactical sometimes uh, it's just critically important so yeah well, that's well summarized yeah well summarized yeah i can do that well <laughs> cool <laughs>